remind the audience that we do have a couple of upcoming sessions. Our, our traditional dashboard diagnostic session will be on the 16th. That's at 8.30 on the Thursday. And then uh, just we're, we're kind of uh, bumping up against Christmas a little bit, but we'll have a, a holiday party on December 21st. And I believe that's the first day of winter um, with the Challenge Club. And then a, a month from today, uh, we'll have another uh, roundtable session. So, so with that, are you there, Mr. McManus? Yeah, you can hear me, I hope. Well, wel welcome back safely. I know you were uh, over there in the middle of everything, over there on the Emerald Isle. Yeah, I was right in the middle of Dublin. And I actually have to leave for Europe again tomorrow. Ooh. Surprise, surprise. So I'm going back and forth quite a bit. This time it's Zurich. It's always nice there at, around Christmas. Sounds nice. But needless to say, you know, when I was in Ireland last week, um, you know, they were likening it to the, the most historic events that happened in Dublin since the uprising in 1916. And I've certainly had a sense of history there uh, because of the, the crisis that I guess is precipitated by, by the banks. And, uh, you know, it just shows how vulnerable banks can be. You have a German chancellor starts talking about sovereign debt and they're open to a default on some uh, sovereign debt. Everyone assumed that was Ireland. And of course, a panic ensued. There was a run on Irish bonds. Uh, it was quite disastrous. Um, and uh, shortly afterwards, of course, the euro became under threat. The Irish economy got heightened scrutiny. It became clear that because interest rates were shooting up on bonds up to the 9% bit, that the foreign markets were, as the Minister of Finance said, prohibitive. They couldn't go and, and finance there. So a bailout had to happen. And I guess um, panic for banks globally spread around the world as well, or at least concerns. And I don't know if you were paying attention today to the news, but there was Wiki, WikiLeaks, WikiLeaks has been in the news quite uh, frequently uh, the last couple of days because of uh, all the diplomatic cables that it managed to get hold of somehow. I don't know how, but it did. Published them to the world. But apparently there's a rumor that it's going to launch a major uh, expose on a U.S. bank early next year. And the founder of WikiLeaks um, said that they have a hard drive or a lot of information on a hard drive from somebody from Bank of America. The stock dutifully dropped a couple of percentage points today. And I suggested buying the stock last time. But of course, the, the price is lower now thanks to a number of factors, including this threat of WikiLeaks. Um, so... I thought I'd double down and suggest buying it one more time. Um, you know, the idea is that it's, it's going to expose how banks handle the mortgage crisis. And I don't know, it's probably going to take a lot to shock me. The banks are driven by self-interest and a profit motive <laughs> you know, rather than trying to help consumers uh, default on loans. But Bank of America, actually, because as you read into this bank, in fact, all of the banks, but you know, I've chosen Bank of America because I think it's kind of undervalued compared to its peers. It's everywhere now. This used to be a small bank, relatively small, not that long ago. Uh, now it's in kind of every market you could think of from consumer lending, which I think we're most familiar with, all the way over to working with the Federal Reserve as a primary dealer. And it's a primary dealer in about 16 countries around the world. It does a lot, both commercial business, consumer, all kinds of banking, credit card service, home loans, insurance, etc. So it is everywhere. And if we move on to the next slide, and by the way, I took this from a presentation that the CEO of, uh, of the bank gave a couple of weeks ago. There was um, um, an audio file available on the site. It has since disappeared, and they're now advertising uh, another uh, presentation that will come in early December. So I will try to listen to that and try to record it if I can. But this bank is very impressive. When you actually look, there's a there's another document you can unload from the website. It's quite large, 70, 80 pages, but it gives great detail. It's an easy read. It gives great detail about where the bank is and what it does and where it is in each of its markets. It's either number one or number two in a surprising number of areas from consumer all the way across to large businesses. And those would be businesses in excess of $2 billion in revenue a year. But it has 53 million customers. Um, it is in every single state, but it's primarily concentrated around the fringe of the U.S., from Washington down to Texas through California. Although it, it jumps across Louisiana for some reason in Mississippi, but it swings around and heads up the East Coast, and it misses Indiana and Ohio. But um, 
It's in, in most states in the union with banks and offering consumer banking services. In fact, consumer and small businesses account for 12% of total revenues. Credit card services, surprisingly to me at least, account for 24% of the revenues. And it's interesting that the, the bank is getting a lot more consumer friendly and trying to develop relationships with its customers in, in anticipation initially of um, rate requirements to do so by the federal government. But it's a, a shift in how it deals with customers. And I think Sai mentioned that last week that he had seen that firsthand with how the bank had kind of changed its tune. For home loans and mortgages, not surprisingly, that business is down a little bit, but it's 14%. It's actually growing and its loan portfolio looks pretty good there. Global banking and institutions is 19 to 20% of its top line. And investment and trading, and that would include things like Merrill Lynch uh -huh. franchise, is 17%. And finally, things like wealth management, global wealth and investment management, uh, is 15% of total revenues. And that includes actually Black, a little bit of BlackRock Capital that it owns as well. But it has its fingers in a lot of pies. It, it's pretty well diversified. It is facing a problem, as all banks are, and we'll show a graph on this towards the end, that because of the interest rate environment that we're now in, it's not as profitable as it once was. All banks are suffering from that. Interest rates are low and some would argue artificially low, but that I think has to change. It can't last forever as the economy starts to recover and it will, interest rates will go up. So moving along, I think we'll skip over this one where it talks about the banking and markets for its uh, corporate activities, but I'll echo back on this topic in the second when we get to the next slide. But when it's actually ranked by its customers, it's ranked very, very highly. Now, it, it's surprising is number one or number two in a lot of global markets, but it's ranked above a lot of its peers, including big names like the Spanish bank, Santander, maybe in trouble, we'll see, um, MetLife, BlackRock, the works, but then JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, etc. All of the all of the big guys, even the Swiss banks, it gets a uh, gets a fair. It it, it really has a, a large market share. So let's move on to the next one. I don't know if the SSG from last week is back in here again, Mark. I did not add it. No. Okay, not not to worry. We we covered that last time, and and really nothing has changed apart from the price has gotten lower. The upside downside ratio looks a little bit better. Um, I'm still happy with the, the growth uh, projections that I had on this. And I, I do think it's set to at least double in the next five years. Um, again, okay, so this, this is an actual, an interesting slide. If you look at the graph that pops out of you in the middle, it says nat national franchise. It really shows where the bank is concentrated and you can see it kind of loops around the country, as I said. What's interesting about it too, is if you go onto the website and I don't know if it, I could download this mark and, and load it up onto Manifest Investing. It's a document that Bank of America produces. It's actually quite good. Uh, it goes through where its ATM distributions are, where its loans are sitting in different parts of the country, etc. It gives a lot of nice graphic detail about what the bank is doing and where it is. But you can see in the chart on the left where it talks about market position, where it's number one or number two in a lot of areas. From brokerage assets, it's a little bit lower, but things about first mortgage initiation, home equity loans, affinity credit cards, all the way up to mobile banking and online banking. Uh, it, it's quite high up on the, on the chart and among its competitors. So let's move on then to the next one. And it is changing the consumer banking model. Um, banks actually were accused for a long time of nickel and diming people to death. Uh, it's tried to come up with a more transparent way to deal with its customers, to try and encourage more activity among its customers and clients so that it can generate fees that way from actually doing something constructive from the customer instead of having the perception of punishing the customer when they, they make a mistake or run foul of some complex rules about uh, when deposits are actually available in the account, when you can write a check against them. Um, so it's trying to move to a more relationship-based approach to dealing with customers in the short run that's going to affect revenues, uh, but they believe because this has essentially been mandated by the government anyway, and I think they're ahead of the curve on this, that they believe that um, since everyone is going to face this issue, they may as well come up front and center and grab the, the nettle immediately, as it were, and uh, tackle this problem head on. I can't say it's paying dividends right now. I was looking through some of its numbers. 
it, it has some things to boast about, and especially about mortgage defaults. It's a little bit lower in the last quarter than it was a year ago. It's generating more revenue from mortgages than it was in the past. Some of its non-interest activities are quite high in terms of their contribution to the top line. But there's nothing that I can see in this change in the consumer banking model that is driving revenues, at least in the short term. This seems to be something that, if it works, it's going to be uh, show up uh, more longer term. So let's move on to the next one. Here's the problem banks face, and they, they face the problem that because interest rates are so low, and on this chart over on the left, it shows interest rate difference differences between checking accounts and what's called the three-month three LIBOR, which is an interbank lending rate. It's the London interbank lending rate, or the offered rate. Uh, essentially, what it earns from your deposits, and the red line is what it gives you from for your deposits. But it's very illustrative of what the problem the banks were facing. In, uh, night, in 2006, which is essentially in the middle of that chart, the spread was, was quite dramatic. It was three or four percentage points. But, and that actually was a very good year for banks. For this year, or last year, 2009, uh, consumers and small businesses were just 12% of the top line. That's about half or even, maybe over half of what it was three or four years ago when that spread was, was more significant. Uh, and banks actually started to see erosion in their top line in 2007 before the recession officially started. But you can see that interest rates collapsed or did something wonky around September of 2008 when it looked like well, the system had actually collapsed, but no one believed it. So it continued moseying along. And today, of course, with people printing money left, right and center, interest rates are still very, very low, surprisingly. And certainly the LIBOR rate is below the the rate that they pay on deposits and checking accounts on average. And so it's not surprising they don't generate a, um, a huge top line uh, from, from that activity. But this is a thing that's, this is an issue that's facing all banks in the US. And as I said, it will improve. And when it improves, the stock, the stock will improve as well. The rules are going to change about what you have to keep in the most, in the safest of all kind, kinds of investments. It's going to double in the next 10 years. Bank of America believes that its balance sheet is in good shape and it will not need an infusion of capital to meet those standards as we go from Basel one to Basel three. Okay. And so wrapping up, uh, it faces many of the same challenges as competitors. I think the bank is in very good shape. Um, I think the news from WikiLeaks is going to make the stock cheaper and cheaper as people speculate what that could be. But I think for all banks, we're very close, I think, to what the, the bottom is, certainly closer than last month. And as the economy improves, so will the banks. And I think Bank of America is well positioned in both the consumer and financial, domestic and global markets to benefit from an improving economy here in the U.S. and globally. So I think all else been equal, the stock is cheaper than it was a month ago. I liked it a month ago, so I'm coming back and buying more. Okay. And I did actually buy more today. Okay. Full disclosure. <laughs> yes. All right. Let's let's go ahead and transition to the next part. Again, this is if this is something that you qualify for and would be interested in, um, contact me. The the email address is shown right down at the bottom, and we're we're looking for some clubs to pilot this with. We have a few in place now, and uh, basically it's just a. Uh, to help clubs out, give them an attractive rate to discover and learn more about manifest investing. So with that, I think Mark, we're ready to, yes. Mark, we have a question for Hugh. Uh, Hugh, Miriam would like to know, uh, can you predict uh, or do you have a prediction about how low Bank America might actually go? No, but I, I, I can't really predict how low it will go. I mean, I, I really can't see how WikiLeaks is going to reveal anything that's going to be shocking to anyone uh, unless they find that the senior management in the bank were colluding in criminal activity. But apart from that, uh, I, I, it's, it's going to scare investors. I don't think there's any question about that. People don't like uncertainty. WikiLeaks obviously is quite a scary concept right now. But to the extent how people react to that and the extent that will affect the stock price, I just have no idea. Yeah, and it, If it, it goes lower, I'll buy more. It comes down to how widespread and every, everything else. Uh, yeah. And, you know, what's the situation, so. It could be worse. It's not, it's Bank of America, not Bank of Ireland. <laughs> wow, that's, that's like self-inflected pain. <laughs> all, all right, I'm going to go ahead and switch gears and switch to... Uh, Mr. Lynch, 